All righty, folks, we are moving into unit two, and we're going to start talking about neurons and action potential. Okay, so this is going to be how a neuron fires. We'll talk about neurotransmitters in our next video, also about 2.1, but for now we are focused on what a neuron is and the action potential for that neuron and how it fires. So let's get into it because this is going to take a while. All right. So a neuron, um, in class we're going to give like the big overview of this. Uh, I'm going to try to get a little bit more detailed and nitty gritty here, right? So the different parts of a neuron that you need to know. One, nucleus, consider this, it's like a cell, kind of the, uh, the brain, the operating systems for a neuron, right? Neurons being, of course, the uh, operating system for our entire brain. This is the, hard the hardware uh, for our brain, right? This is the actual like wiring within our brain. It's how we communicate electrically throughout our brain. Whenever we do anything, we have firing neurons throughout our body communicating with each other, right? Whenever you are watching this right now, your eyes are sending signals um, by receiving light, and then the neurons that are connected there are going to be blasting messages through your brain. Your brain's going to be processing this as different uh, neurons are receiving this information and then sending it on to others. So this is the wiring of your brain. So what is made up of that? Okay. So a neuron, you've got your like small nucleus in the center of the cell body. This is, of course, like the kind of brains of each neuron. They're the ones that are going to think about and to figure out if they need to send a message or not. Cell body or soma is going to be what keeps it alive. Soma is sustenance uh, or soma is survival. The dendrites and axons um, are probably the most likely things you'll get asked about, possibly myelin chief. But dendrites and axons are the two sides of the communication. Dendrites are your receivers. Dendrites detect. It's the best way to remember that. That's a little mnemonic, alliteration for you. Dendrites are going to detect information. They're receiving information from another neuron, and they are conducting that towards the cell body to see. And then the cell body is going to determine if it needs to push that message forward um, and send the message forward. This is the known as this electrical impulse. Um, it's it going to send that or not. The cell body receives enough information necessary to do that, makes that decision. It's going to blast that message forward. The electrical impulse travels along the axon and out the axon terminal. So axons announce. Okay, The dendrite is going to be connected to another neuron's axon or axon terminal. Okay, the axon is going to announce to another dendrite somewhere else the message that has been sent to it. Um, so dendrites detect information, axons announce it, um, and they do so out of their terminal or the tip of the axon. Okay, so if the terminal is the tip, it's the very end of the axon. The axon is like the long um, piece that is sending that electrical impulse out. Only other thing you should recognize are these myelin sheath. Myelin sheath. Um, is one that I see pop up quite a bit in questions. This is like a fat blanket. Okay, it's fatty tissue that is insulating your axon so that it can travel faster, right? The more myelin sheath that you have, the faster you are able to process information. Um, this is a big reason why most people are not at their cognitive peak until they're in their mid to late 20s, right? Women peak in their uh, early to mid 20s, right? Men are not finished myelinating until they're 29 or 30 on average. So these myelin sheath build up over our lives and allow us to process information even faster, right? This is one of the main theories as to why youth um, have much lower self-control on average. Um, they uh, aren't quite as good of ju judges when it comes to uh, making the right decisions. Uh, quick making decisions is oftentimes because you're, you haven't had been able, aren't able to quickly process risks in the same way that adults are with um, increased myelin sheath. Um, and then we'll talk about some disorders throughout this unit. One that you should recognize when it comes to myelin sheath is multiple sclerosis um, or S or MS is uh, due to myelin, a lack of myelination or your myelin sheath deteriorating over your life um, and eventual complete loss of muscle control because without that myelin sheath, you can't communicate between um, your brain and like motor neurons, which are telling your different parts of the muscles and the parts of the body to move. So myelin sheath, if you want to remember again, alliteration MS and MS, because myelin sheath deteriorates, it can cause, um, it can cause multiple sclerosis. Um, in between those myelin sheath, there's just another way of, of um, kind of way of seeing a neuron. See how here, like another neuron has its axon terminals connected to the dendrites of this one. 
um, dendrites of this neuron, receive the message, send it along the axon and out the axon terminal. But along that axon, you've got this myelin sheath. Um, and in between the myelin sheath, it needs to be able to have contact with like brain fluid or uh, the outs outside of the neuron so that it can keep the proper chemical balance and the nodes of RAMVR allow it to do that. Um, they able to recharge signals um, along the axon. So the axon, and we'll talk about this later, needs to have a certain chemical or and um, kind of electrical charge. And so for it to have that, it needs to have these nodes of Ranvier in here between the myelin sheath, um, these nodes of Ranvier for it to uh, recharge and maintain its tendency to send the message. If it loses that charge, it'll be like, oh, false alarm, we don't need to send this message anymore. So it's got to have these nodes of Ranvier between this myelin sheath for it to uh, remember, right? Basically continue to be reminded like, hey, keep sending it. Hey, keep sending it. Hey, keep sending it. Okay. Um, other little uh, pieces that you need to know outside of the neuron are these little thing called glial cells. Um, in studies of geniuses, uh, for instance, Albert Einstein's brain, um, which he donated for science and his brain was has been continued to be studied as he has um, even after he's been gone. Uh, what scientists and, and biologists have found is that neurons are pretty much the same for everybody. Most people have the same network, right? The amount of neurons we have is not that different, right? We've got billions of neurons uh, throughout our brain and everybody is more or less kind of the same, no matter how smart you are. What you see, though, is in people that are excessively or are known as geniuses are in incredibly intelligent, like Albert Einstein, they have min much, uh, many, many more glial cells. Right. And so these are like support systems. OK, these are things that make sure that your myelin sheath is always there. So remember, myelin sheath allows you to process information faster. It allows you to send information through your neurons faster. The more glial cells, the better you can do this. So these are your support system for your neurons. They're going to make sure your neurons stay in place. They're going to solidify and make sure these are like think of them as like infrastructure. Right. They're quickly think of it. Your ability to get from one place to the other is if we're driving in a car is depending on how effective the roads are, what the speed limits are. If there's potholes, glial cells are there to make sure that the roads are totally clean, that they are bridges are completely structured, that everyone can drive um, a speedy speed limit without any danger. Like they are there to make sure everything is moving quickly. And the more you have of those, um, the more. Um, structured and more speedy your neural processing is going to be. So these are there basically as the cleanup crews, the infrastructure crew for our um, for our brains. Okay, um, and we'll talk about the different types of systems, but just know that um, neat glial cells have different names in the different systems. This just write it down; it'll make more sense later. But for now, just know that central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, um, their glial cells, which are doing the same thing, have slightly different names because they have different forms, right? And you can um, see kind of what that looks like uh, in just like different types of them. They're not all exactly the same. So central nervous systems are oligodendrocytes, whereas peripheral uh, nerve, nervous system glial cells are known as Schwann cells. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in depth um, in when we're talking about the systems. But just for now, jot it down. Um, know that for the future. So that is the basics of how it works. Now we're going to talk about how it fires, right? That's the structure of a neuron. Um, and probably the more complex or difficult thing to understand um, is not just what it is and what each part is supposed to do, but how it knows to do that, right? If we have billions of these, how do they know? How are my neurons able to, right now, read the information on the screen and then process and think about what it is I need to say to you to help you understand it, right? My brain is firing all over. Millions of my neurons at one time are talking to each other and communicating in order for me to read, process, and think about what I need to say next for to help you understand what a neuron is. Similarly, your neurons are doing the same thing. What tells them to do that? So stimulation is the short, short answer, right? Um, when our neurons are stimulated, they get chemical signals um, that tell them, um, hey, something's happening. Talk to the next guy, pass it along, right? This is like, a, like they're like telephone wires, um, except that instead of one being connected to the next, it's um, thousands being connected to thousands at a time. And it's sending out in like this wave across your brain instead of just like one talks to the next guy, talks to the next guy. So what they're firing is this brief electrical charge traveling through the action axon, and this is known as an action potential. Okay, The action potential is the firing of the neuron. 
this is the uh, process for how a message fires or transmits between neurons. When we say action potential, um, this is when, um, you see this here, when a message or electrical impulse travels down the axon. Okay, the axons, most of them are short, but many of them can be quite long, right? We're talking like inches long in the body. Um, they oftentimes can like lots of them group together to form nerves. Um, and you can actually like feel them in your fingers, lots of axons mixed together. But an action potential fires electrical impulses through that axon. Okay, it always travels in the same direction. And um, we are, can, it travels up to, uh, they, they can move very quickly, depending on glial cells and then where the axon is, up to 180 miles per hour. Okay, this isn't like instant, right? We talked about the Wilhelm Wundt studies where you needed to process information and you needed to hear information and how different that is, right? We don't immediately process information and know everything. Um, it has to move in between our brains in different parts of our body, right? When you touch something hot, you move back pretty quickly, but it's not like a it, right it's relatively immediate but like um, that information has to move quickly right like from your finger up to your head but it's not an instantaneous thing that information still has to move um and oftentimes up to 180 miles per hour through your body so these action potentials and neural signals um again we know that they get stimulated in some way what does that look like? Okay, and this is going to get pretty kind of chemistry heavy on you. So um, you may need to watch this again. Okay, and that's the beauty of the Ed Puzzle of the um, of these YouTubes that you have the chance to go back, rewind, watch it again until you understand it. If you have questions, come back, watch it again. You can always rewind and check back again. So how is this working? Right, this is the process of an action potential. Remember, we've talked about um, we've talked about neurons. Firing as the same process as a toilet, right? It's sitting there just chilling with a bowl full of water. Um, it's in resting potential and nothing is happening. And eventually, uh, once it, it's going to re start receiving enough of a stimulant to begin the depolarization or flushing um, and reach that threshold and it immediately takes off does the whole thing. Um, but once it's done, it finishes its action potential. It does its job. A toilet finishes flushing or a neuron finishes its action potential and sends its message. It has to reset up. A toilet has to refill with water. Um, a neuron has to um, recharge back to where it, it, it rests. So it repolarizes um, oftentimes, because it's trying to do so quickly, um, it shoots down below and then comes back to a resting state where it can then fire once again. Okay, it has to repolarize, go through this refractory period where it can't fire. But once it hits the resting state again, it can once again fire. So things you'd recognize on here. One, threshold is biggie, right? You notice these failed interactions here. Um, this means that it got some, some um, stimulation. Okay, it got a stimulation that said, hey, get ready. Right? If you're flushing a toilet, you jiggle the handle. Um, the toilet technically is getting ready to flush. It may start like leaking a little bit of water, might start thinking about what it's going to do. Um, but until it hits that threshold, nothing happens. But once it hits that threshold, it will always fire. It will always depolarize. There's no like threshold and we're done, right? If it hits this, it's all the way. It is an all or nothing response. Okay, all or nothing. And that all or nothing for neurons is a balance of a negative 55. Just know that term. Um, that is on the electrical balance, um, the voltage. It's always sitting at negative 70. So basically, it's going to be sitting with a lot of potassium in there and enough sodium. We'll talk about this in a bit, but more enough sodium is going to come in positive ions to move it up negative 50, negative 15 in voltage to where it crosses this threshold. And the second it crosses the threshold, it fires. Okay, if it hits negative 56, right, it's not going to fire. No, it's same, it's negative 56 is the same as negative 68, right? Nothing. Okay, until it gets to negative 55, it's going. But it gets to negative 55, it will always fire. It will always go off with that action potential, depolarize, repolarize, refractory, and then rest. Okay, so threshold is a biggie. Know that you have to get past that, but if you get past that, it always fires. Um, and that is known as that all or nothing response. Right. The gun either fires or it doesn't. OK, another good example of that. You can't just like finagle with the trigger and get the gun to fire, like just release the bullet. Right. It's firing full speed or it's not firing at all. Toilets are flushing all the way. There's no like half flush unless you got one of those fancy two button toilets. So 
We talked through this a little bit um, in the last slide, but these are the key terms, right? Resting potential is its constant state sitting at negative 70. That means it's just chilling. It's ready to go. It has um, more of like negative fluid on the inside. Oftentimes, this is or always, um, this is going to be mostly potassium with a little bit of sodium. Okay, this is on the inside. Don't get too caught up in kind of the, the chemistry and physics of this, uh, but just recognize that on the inside of a neuron, this is the inside of a neuron here. Okay, inside of a neuron, we've got a lot of potassium um, and a little bit of sodium. And there's a lot of the opposite on the outside. The outside is very, very sodium heavy. And they're often trying to get in. But once there's stimulation, more of them are going to come in. That's how that stimulation works. It's stimulated by getting more sodium. If it gets a little bit of sodium and gets to negative 60, it didn't cross the threshold. Remember, um, or, or, but once it gets to negative 55, the threshold, the action potential will always go so once enough of that sodium moves into the um uh, moves into the cytoplasm or into the neuron and or enough potassium leaves it and the balance goes from negative 70 to negative 55 the neuron will fire okay it'll hit that action potential and say let's go it will depolarize um axon gates open sodium flies in like domino effect it happens every time um, all of the sodium gates then open and it's a rush of information Okay, you see that here, depolarization, tons of sodium rushing in, right? Rush upwards in depolarization. And then um, you're going to see that repolarization here um, in which now we've got to rebalance it, right? We've got to now rebalance it and get it back to the way it was. Okay, so repolarizing um, is potassium flooding out of the axon gates um, and eventually uh, returning it back to the way that it was. Okay, you want to get it back to the balance that it was. Um, and this kind of period where it's not ready to fire once again, that's this. Okay, sitting right here, it's like it hasn't got quite reached back to its um, resting potential. It is not able to fire. It has to get back to resting period before it can fire once again. So um, I again recommend if you haven't checked this video out, it does a great job of explaining um, how this exa is exactly like a toilet. We watched this a little bit in class. Um, strongly recommend that if you haven't uh, to check that out and get a little bit of a better understanding. Okay. Um, last thing to talk about is, yes, you know they're connected. Yes, you know that it's receiving some stimulation. Um, but what's actually happening on the, the, between the dendrites and the axons, dendrites and the axon terminal? So um, what we're seeing here, what you're looking at is you've got a connection point. You see the whole box here. You've got this connection point between a dendrite. Okay, These are the dendrites around the cell body and the axon, the axon terminal. Okay, this thing here is your axon terminal, the end of the axon terminal. This other side here is your dendrites. Okay, it's your dendrites, the cell body, um, which is going to be detecting or receiving the information. The axons, remember, announcing the information. So how does it do that? How does it process um, and then send the information? When that action potential comes rushing down the axon and gets to the terminal, it doesn't then just shoot out across. What it does is it's sending a message to the axon terminal to tell it, hey, release the goods because the axon terminal terminal is basically like a storage place okay the axon terminal um what a terminal think of it is like trains it's got like a station with a bunch of different trains and it decides when to release them or not um but like a terminal axon terminal is the same thing instead of trains it's holding on to a lot of different sacks um or sacks of different neurotransmitters and we'll talk about these in our next ed puzzle lecture but um it's holding on to these sacks of, of neurotransmitters and this is a, just basically a chemical information. It's going to process and it, it's going to transmit information. And so once that axon term or the um, the action potential right comes rushing down this axon right comes rushing down the axon gets to here okay gets on the axon terminal. So we're zooming in now the axon terminal. And if it the axon potential makes it to here the axon terminal is like release all the goods and all of these sacks full of neurotransmitters are going to push their way out and those neurotransmitters or kind of chemicals are going to rush out into and across to the dendrite and the dendrite then receives them it's receiving the message that have been like bouncing between the axon terminal and the dendrite and where that's happening is known as this synaptic gap okay so um, you can recognize the axon and the axon terminal is the uh, where it's sending the message is your presynaptic. 
This is your presynaptic neuron. It's just, they're all, they're both neurons. This is just the neuron that's sending the message. Whereas the postsynaptic neuron is the one that's receiving it. Um, and just think of it as a one, two is the synaptic gap. Three is the post. So pre synapse, post synapse. Your synaptic gap or synaptic space is the space in between there where that message or the neurotransmitter is jumping across. Okay. Um, so that transmission, when it's happening, um, is within those synaptic vesicles full of that neurotransmitters, these chemical messengers that's sending message across the synaptic gap. Um, yeah, those vesicles are the sacs and the axon terminals. They are packaging up and storing information. If you want to see on a better level what that looks like, um, here's kind of an example. Right. The action potential flies along, hits this, it releases those neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters then bounce around um, and eventually reach a receptor on the dendrite or a dendrite, which is a part of the postsynaptic neuron. Okay. So the synaptic vesicles release the neurotransmitters out of the axon terminal across the synaptic gap or synaptic space to the post synaptic dendrite or postsynaptic neuron. Okay, last cell, um, last thing we're going to talk about um, is when that happens. Okay, when that happens, you saw here, right? You noticed here at the end, um, oftentimes is they're sending out, right, after that action potential send, tells it to release, it can't, they can't all get in there. Right? They can't all make their way into the uh, dendrites. Right? The dendrite isn't going to take all of them. Um, and so once the dendrite receives enough of them, it's like, I got your message. Chill, man. You can, you can take the rest of them back. And the body's very effective. It doesn't want to waste anything. It doesn't have to. So it has this process called reuptake. Okay. So uh, once these little neurotransmitters have gone across, um, uh, they have gotten accepted by the dendrite, they just, the dendrite's going to release them and say, all right, you've done your job. Go back. Um, and they return back to the postsynaptic neuron in a process known as reuptake. Okay, reuptake. Um, the presynaptic neuron says, "Hey, you got my message. Now give me those back." Consider this like it's passing a note to the dendrites, um, but it says, "After you're done with this note, please return it to me." That's these neurotransmitters. The notes go across the synaptic gap. The dendrite reads the message and is like cool, bro, I'm done with that. You can take it back now and sends it back to the presynaptic neuron and the axon terminal, which then re-accepts them. Okay. It accepts them back into themselves so that they can use it again later. Okay. Again later. Um, this is something that pops up a lot in uh, medicine. There are reuptake re inhibitors. For instance, the one of the main um, medications for depression is an SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitor that basically stops your presynaptic neuron, neuron from taking uh, serotonin back into it, meaning that there's more serotonin constantly floating around for your dendrites to receive. Serotonin, kind of a feel-good neurotransmitter that improves your mood, makes you feel better. So if you block the presynaptic neuron from uh, grabbing back that, um, all right, once again, I'm going to like re-receiving all of that information, right? If you block it from, um, from re-uptaking it, Right? It, you keep it out here in the synaptic gap instead of it all sucking back into the presynaptic neuron, then there's more serotonin here to bounce around and for the dendrites to receive, meaning you're sending more feel-good messages to your brain. We'll talk about that more when we get to neurotransmitters. But for that, uh, I'm sorry it was a long one, a little bit over 23 minutes, uh, but this is a big topic. You got to know it and it can be confusing. So I wanted to give you as much information and examples as I could. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. If not, bring questions to class. Um, otherwise, uh, I trust that you all, my scholars, are killing it right now and you've got all this down. But if you don't, let me know. I'll be more than happy to help. Much love, folks. See you. I want to see you.